Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Mark Andrews, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. I am technical editor of Photonic Integrated Circuits Magazine, Silicon Semiconductor, and Power Electronics World within Angel Business Communications. With us today is Mr. Jim Bonfiel, product manager of OptoElectronics within OptiWave. Our webinar focuses on OptiSpice, an important plugin within the OptiWave library of simulation tools that aids and enables photonic integrated circuit design, simulation, and optimization. Jim will show us how OptiSpice works with third-party EDA tools to optimize your chip's design and also give us some background on the development of OptiSpice. Jim's work at OptiWave focuses on ways to simplify, enhance, and optimize PIC design. He's a graduate of Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada, with a bachelor's degree in engineering physics. He holds a master's degree in electrical engineering with a focus on the simulation of optoelectronic devices and systems. Since his graduation, Jim has authored multiple papers on optoelectronic device simulation. He joined OptiWave in 2015, managing development of the OptiSpice plugin while also collaborating with industry and academia. OptiWave is the emerging leader in developing innovative software tools for the design, simulation, and optimization of photonic components, links, systems, networks for photonic nanotechnology, optoelectronics, optical networks, and related applications. Since its 1994 inception, OptiWave's software has been licensed by thousands of industry-leading corporations and universities in over 80 countries worldwide. Key to its success has been OptiWave's focus on design automation and customized engineering design services that can vastly shorten time to market while dramatically improving quality, productivity, and cost effectiveness. Following today's webinar, we will take questions from the live audience to further explore the capability of OptiWave's OptiSpice software and tips on how you can shorten your company's design cycle time while enhancing PIC device performance. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Jim Bonfail. Um, Mark, uh, thank you very much for a great introduction. So let me share my screen quickly and start the webinar. Okay. So today um, I'll be talking about how we used uh, OptiSpice in combination of uh, neural nets um, to do circuit optimization and help um, device design. Um, so I'll be initially introducing our products and talking about OptiSpice and what it does and different versions of it. Uh, I'll briefly introduce neural networks. I'm sure by the time everybody's comfortable with them, but still um, just to make sure I'll go over briefly. Um, I'll be talking about uh, how we combine the PIC design and neural nets and then um, with that combination, what we uh, did with OptiSpice to add photonic integrated circuit design uh, using neural nets. We have two different applications that we'll be, we'll be going over. One is um, a neural net based optical circuit. And then um, I'll be talking about how we use neural nets for modeling support for various applications. We have various products. Um, starting from um, system level, OptiSystem, which is a very powerful tool for designing optoelectronic systems and circuits and devices uh, and circuits. Um, then we have uh, chip circuit and design software, OptiSpice, which I'm managing. Um, and it's also uh, possible to combine it with uh, third party EDA tools uh, with the OptiSpice plugin. Then we have device design software, four of them uh, BPM, FDTD, fiber, and grating. Um, those can be used alongside with OptiSpice or OptiSystem uh, to build your circuit. And finally, we have uh, instrument and control automation. This is a relatively new software. Um, it is designed for remote controlling or computer controlling um, instrumentation and uh, measurement software and automation of measurements as well. And it will be also connected with OptiSystem so you can read the results of um, your experiments into OptiSystem and build a larger circuit. So let's briefly talk about OptiSpice. OptiSpice um, is based on the standard SPICE, which is commonly used for analog circuit design. 
and specifically for integrated circuits. So it has this, um, our SPICE library includes uh, standard electrical devices like resistors, capacitors, inductors, uh, and nonlinear devices like BJTs and MOSFETs and all sorts of electrical models. Additionally, we have expanded this to enable optical simulations um, with multi-mode, multi-channel, bi-directional capability. Um, the OptiSpy software uh, is capable of running different um, the simulations in various different domains, time and frequency. Uh, we can do DC sweeps as well. And um, it is a very powerful tool for analyzing and designing photonic integrated circuits. One of the main advantages is it allows electro-optic feedback loops very well. So if you have control circuits, and if, you have, if you're designing both optics and electronics, it is very seamless to put the system together and um, generate an integrated circuit and analyze the circuit. Now, we have two versions of SPICE, uh, OptiSPICE, which is um, the, the image you showed earlier belonged to the standalone where it comes with um, its own schematic editor and additional and a waveform viewer and additional uh, curve fitting tools. We also have the plugin version uh, which communicates with um, third-party uh, software vendor tools. Um, here we have, for example, um, Siemens EDA, uh, and uh, we have a pl plugin uh, for the Siemens EDA. What we provide is a set of optical models to work with um, the simulation engine that comes with uh, Siemens EDA, T-SPICE. What it does is um, it enables the user to keep their design in um, their preferred environment and use OptiWave's OptiSpice uh, photonic integrated circuit library to build their design. So we, they can do either a schematic uh, and then do their simulations or they can prepare a mask layout and then extract the circuit and do th their simulations as well. Now let's talk a little bit about neural nets. I mean, as you all know, um, it is the mathematical model is based on a biological neuron where you have a series of signals coming in uh, and then they, it gets summed up or combined in the nucleus and then sent forward. Um, and the, 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 and um, these signals also connect further to other neurons. So the basic neuron model, the mathematical model we're using um, which takes a series of inputs, multiplies those inputs by certain weights, and then sends it to an activation function. And the activation function, as you can see below, it looks like a, like a sigmoid. There, there are very, various uh, different activation functions being used for neural nets. Uh, for this exercise, we use a sigmoid. And um, using the simple neural model, then we can build a network to represent um, various different um, uh, functionalities. And the way um, that is done is through uh, backward propagation, usually, um, where you provide an input and then it needs to guess the output. And um, through the optimization of or the optimization of process of backward propagation, uh, we train the neural net um, to give the correct results. Now, where this can be used, it is uh, the neural net is a very flexible modeling tool. Um, you can firstly, uh, with OptiSpice, what you can do is uh, you can build an optical or an electrical circuit um, for a neural net. Um, and it, you can also do a photonic integrated chip design. So a, a photonic integrated chip design of a neural net. Um, another thing you can do is you can actually use a neural net as a control circuit. And this is a very interesting application um, where um, you use the, you, you can uh, run your simulations over and over again and generate training data for the neural net. Um, let's say you're trying to control, um, make sure that the resonators are on or off resonance or control the temperature uh, of a laser via active cooling. Um, you can train a neural net to do that. And with OptiSpice, because it is very powerful in being able to handle elect electro-optic feedback loops, you can actually have a neural net device and run um, the simulation while your neural net is, is, is controlling the circuit operation. So now how we can um, model neural nets with an OptiSpice. Um, we use basic standard um, set of optical devices. Um, to be able to distribute an incoming signal, we, use, we, use, we can use a series of directional couplers 
and then to apply weight to each signal, uh, we use a mock sender modulator and a phase shifter. Um, the phase shifter is important because we need to combine everything with the correct phase because we're dealing with optical signals. Uh, finally, um, the results are summed together and sent to the activation function. So here is an example of an OR circuit based on a neural net. Um, the first two, let me see if I can pull, oh, sorry. Okay, so the first two um, so the devices, uh, they're mock sender modulators, they handle the input. Um, these two blocks, they handle the weights of each input and then they are summed together using the joiners uh, and they go to a saturable absorber, which plays the role of the activation function. Now, the other portion that I'll be talking about, which is the circuit optimization, um, we used, so we collaborated with Carleton University to create, create some uh, neural net based um, models, uh, modeling capability uh, for our basic photonic devices. We have um, in, in the, few, in the, in the come, upcoming slides, I'll be showing you um, how we applied this concept. What we use the neural net for is we mapped the physical parameters to simulation parameters. What I'm saying, for example, uh, when you have a waveguide, um, usually the waveguide is modeled through um, its effective index and length. Um, based on and based on the incoming frequency, you can generate, you can figure out the time delay, the phase shift, and loss. Now, when you have an actual photonic integrated circuit, the thickness and the width of the waveguide may not be constant. We need to be able to model that. So we um, introduce, and this concept can be applied. It's very simple, but it can be applied to almost all the optical models or even electrical models. Um, so we use the neural nets to map between physical device, physical device parameters to simulation parameters. What this can be used with is, um, we can use this with device optimization, parameter sweep, Monte Carlo, circuit optimization, corner and sensitivity analysis, and I'll show you some applications of that. Now, the first model that uh, we'll be looking at is a waveguide model. What the neural net, we train the neural net to be able to take uh, physical parameters as an input and generate an effective um, as a function of frequency. Um, so it actually takes frequency in as well, though I didn't put that as a, as a physical. This is a simulation parameter in our case. Um, and it generates an effective as a function of um, wavelength or frequency. The second one, so we did this model slightly differently. The, the, the waveguide model does a straight map from the input physical parameters to the simulation parameters. The directional coupler model, uh, we decided to use a fitting function in between where um, the neural net takes a gap and it calculates a series of uh, fitting functions to the, the fitting equation you can see over here. And this fitting equation, once you, once you evaluate it, it gives you a coupling coefficient then that we can use for the directional coupler modeling. Now, combining these two models, we decided to build a neural net based um, circuit um, and we end up with a ring resonator. So we have two ring resonators and we use this um, circuit as a use case, as a test case scenario. The waveguide, it has the thickness and the width um, and the directional coupler has the gap. So for this circuit, the design goal is actually having a flat top filter at a particular uh, frequency range. What we did with this um, circuit is we use a scripting tool to be able to achieve our goal. So what we, we did was uh, we used um, Python to, to change uh, the parameters of the circuit and then run the circuit for various scenarios um, for different sets of parameters. Um, The neural net, so we, the first thing we tried was, well, we need to be able to do the parameter sweep when we're doing the, um, the design so that we can find the values we're interested in. So we did a basic parameter sweep 
and we swept the width of the waveguide. Um, we also swept the the, the the gap of the of the coupler as well. And you can see as you change the width of the waveguide, um, the um, the the power output changes um, based on frequency. So it shifts the resonant frequency shifts. Uh, as well as, although I know it's a little bit difficult, but the FSR, it's difficult to see here, the FSR um, changes as well, because as you sweep the width, the effective index changes and affects, and that changes the FSR and the uh, resonant frequency. Um, the gap also has uh, its effect. Um, you see the green, uh, green line, it has a pretty nice flat curve at the top. Uh, however, as the gap changes, this flat topness uh, disappears. Either we end up with a loss or we end up with a dip in the center frequency that we're interested in, in the resonant frequency that we're interested in. And you can see that the, the gap, uh, the, the sensitivity to gap and the waveguide width is, is quite high actually. Now that we have an idea of the values we're interested in, um, the second an uh, analysis that we performed was an optimization. Um, we wanted to be able to optimize the, the width of the waveguide to have transmission at a particular wavelength. And to do that, all we did was we played with the, with the series of parameters, looked at the output and used an optimizer to decide whether um, we re reached our goal or not. So here we can see um, what's going on with the optimizer as we sweep um, the waveguide width. Um, the first, first graph shows um, um, through iterations what happens with the, uh, with the width and what the optimizer is trying. And after about 10 iterations, it does converge to a certain value. And you can see that being reflected at the bottom graph. So early iterations, the plots, so this is zero, second, fourth, and 10th iteration. Um, the wavelength, the resonant frequency shifts around, but eventually, once we reach our goal, the resonant frequency becomes constant and it doesn't change anymore. And we can see that we have attained our goal as the absolute error drops after the 10th iteration. Um, the other analysis we did is a Monte Carlo simulation. So now that we have optimized, we, we decided on the values that we wanted, we have optimized the circuit, the last thing we want to look at is, well, if we want to build this um, with as a mask layout and then um, fabricate it, um, what's going to be our chip yield? In order to do that, um, what we did was we set up um, average values and, and, um, and a standard deviation for the fabrication process. So the average value is the value or the target value um, that we're interested in. And then we have a standard deviation um, on the um, accuracy of the fabrication. And then we ran three different scenarios uh, with different uh, tolerances for the fabrication. Uh, the probability distribution we use for, for, for this was Gaussian, though we're not limited. We can have um, a uniform probability distribution or other kinds of probability distributions as well. So as you can see, um, the worst the tolerance gets, the worse the chip yield gets. If our tolerance or the standard deviation is about 10 nanometers in the, um, in the first curve, um, you can see that our, uh, first of all, after many iterations, um, we are able to reach uh, convergence. And you can see that our chip yield is about 90%, which is not too bad, but it, it quickly deteriorates um, as the tolerances get worse. Um, this is the end of my presentation. So overall, um, what I wanted to show is how we can use um, neural networks in different ways to help the design of photonic integrated circuits. And um, one of the main goals was actually to be able to um, alleviate some of the constraints of standard models that every, a lot of people are using, for example, um, you can think of standard passive devices like a directional coupler or an MMI um, that can be enhanced by using neural net modeling 
and enabling the user to play with the uh, dimensions of the device and still be able to um, do their simulations. The thing is, um, it helps the users in many different ways because they don't have to go back and rerun if they want, want to design um, their, optimize their device, they don't have to go back and rerun uh, costly 3D electromagnetic simulations to characterize the, those devices. These simulations need to be done, run once. And once they run, we use them to train the neural net and quickly you have a very powerful tool to be able to design the circuit you need. Thank you very much for listening. I'm looking forward to having your questions. Thank you, Jim. That was a great presentation. I, I, I appreciate it whenever anyone dives in, gives us great information, and then uh, stands for questions. Uh, Jim, and we've got a bunch, so I'm going to uh, uh, just dive in here. One has to do with, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, at the outset that the development of the OptiSpice plugin was based on, I suppose, what some would consider as a biological model, neurons, uh, like those found inside the human brain. Uh, could you please uh, uh, explain this just a little bit more and why this model was chosen and how the approach benefits PIC design needs, please? Um, yes. Um, so there are a few reasons why we chose um, to use neural net with OptiSpice. Um, <clears throat> one of them lies on um, the flexibility it gives for designing devices and how to map um, the physical parameters to the simulation parameters. Uh, when you look at, um, I'll, I'll just actually take a step back and, and talk a little bit about, you know, the electrical modeling uh, for, for, for integrated circuits and how it compares with the uh, optical modeling. The electrical, uh, when, when uh, you're working with an electronic uh, circuit design toolkit, usually you get a very flexible set of um, electrical models um, that has a standard way of extracting its parameters and building a model. I'm specifically thinking about um, electrical devices like um, MOSFETs and BJTs. Now, when you look at an optical counterpart, um, uh, most of the most of the fabs um, with most of the fabs, you end up with a, a fixed set of photonic devices that provide you a single functionality. But you, you don't have unless you do the costly 3D simulation or the fabrication from scratch yourself um, to do the modeling, you only have, you know, a specific functionality and a specific uh, uh, physical dimensions. With the neural net model, um, we work with the fabs to generate a larger set of modeling capabilities for, for a certain um, physical device, whether it can be passive or active. Um, where um, we run a series of simulations and pre-generate a lot of results for a particular device and then use the neural net. So now here comes what, what we do with the neural net. The training, uh, the way that the neural net trained is very flexible in terms of the amount of data you feed it. It, it usually converges fast to a good result in terms of being able to do either, either interpolation or extrapolation of uh, sim parameterized simulation results. So it could be S parameters, or as you've seen in the, um, in my example, it could be a directional, the coupling coefficient for a directional coupler. So, um, and on top of, so this is the, the, the photonic, inter how um, neural networks help uh, photonic integrated circuits. Uh, on top of that, um, we are planning on building um, a neural net device, either for both optical and electrical, in, as, as a device model into OptiSpice. And <clears throat> it can be trained, pre-trained with simulation results and used to optimize uh, a circuit as it's running. I know it is, it is a rather interesting application um, because um, then the control of the circuit, it becomes automated with the neural net if, you, uh, if it's be, been pre-trained and we can see the performance of the neural net in transient as it's optimizing the circuit operation, like maybe trying to minimize the noise or optimize um, filters or change control the, the temperature of a laser. This, these, all these things can be done um, using neural nets. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate that. That was a very, very good explanation. 
Uh, one is a, uh, 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 I've got another question here that came in. I'm gonna jump to it uh, out of the order. So I apologize if anyone thinks I'm missing your question. I'm not, I'm just going to something that uh, uh, ties back to the neural net question. Um, uh, uh, there's actually two that relate to this um, uh, manner of operation. Uh, are there any publications uh, that describe this work that that you based um, uh, that OptiWave based its work on, uh, uh, tying to the optical modeling of the uh, neuron uh, network elements, and then also uh, a follow-up question from a different caller: uh, Which version or type of uh, OptiSpice uh, uh, utilizes the neural approach, or or I, I suppose mm -hmm. the other part of that question might be, or or do all of them? So uh, I hope that's not too complicated, Kim. Jim, I try to uh, keep that simple. Um, yeah, sure. So I'll, I'll I'll start with the first question. So the um, yeah the actually the reference that I have shown um, goes into detail on the the modeling and, and the simulation aspect of how we have the 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 um, training data has been generated and what kind of neural net has been used and what kind of results we got with the training data. So you can definitely look at the reference um, to, to see the details of how, how this work has been um, carried out. Um, related to the, the version, um, that the version of OptiSpice that uses the neural network, right now it's the plugin version um, that does this support um, and it can be used with um, Siemens EDA. Uh, formerly known as uh, Tanner. The standalone version, we don't have this support yet. Um, one of the main reasons that is it is the case is this, uh, the plugin version is specifically geared uh, for supporting photonic integrated circuits. And this is best done with integration with large EDA tools. Um, so we picked to develop this, we picked uh, the, the plugin version to do the development uh, with this uh, idea in mind. Okay, thank you, thank you, Jim. We have a, we have a question that I think you just answered, but 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 since someone uh, uh, gave it, I'm I'm going to go over it again. So so this was uh, uh, just to clarify. So OptiSpice uh, works now as a uh, plugin, and you're working towards building it as a uh, uh, standalone program. Is that correct, or is there any kind of a, a timeline that you can share with us at this point? Well, no, no, no. We have, we have actually, we started with the full version of OptiSpice, and then we developed the plugin afterwards. Um, in terms of optical modeling capabilities, in general, they're on par with each other. The same, it, it uses the same framework. Um, the difference is that um, the plugin is designed to work with a host a, a Spice simulation engine. Um, it uses the standard uh, Spice approach and builds on top of that. So any simulation engine that has a modeling API that is capable of taking um, a standard electrical device uh, can also accept our plugin, of course, with, with some work involved. Um, and the standalone version comes with its own um, user interface and additional uh, curve fitting tools. But the, the plugin version comes just as a plugin, so the users uh, would need to purchase um, another product like uh, Siemens CDA to be able to use the plugin. Uh, and they would be using completely, so when they're using the, the plugin version, um, they don't use our interface at all. They only use the host engine uh, engine's user interface. Okay, all right. Uh, thank you, thank you, Jim. Uh, appreciate that clarification. Uh, just a, uh, another question that came up interesting, uh, uh, is OptiSpice utilized for active or passive components uh, or both? Um, right now, OptiSpice has a set of uh, passive and active components um, on the optical, both optical. I mean, the stand standalone is, is focused on the optical components because the electrical components usually come from the host engine. Um, and for the optical components, we have both passive and active devices. So I mean, we have uh, for passives, we have the basic S parameter, which covers a large set of devices. Um, and then we have modulators, phase shifters, um, waveguide crossings. Um, and for actives, we have um, a laser device. 
um, and we have a photo diode as well, and we're we're working on adding more um, on top of that. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Well, it sounds like the portfolio is growing, and that's uh, uh, always uh, great because it, it to me it means that. Uh, not only uh, uh, is the uh, program working, but that uh, customers are working with you to uh, kind of guide and ask for development and look for new ways that uh, 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 the program could be expanded to better meet their needs or, or new needs, if you will. Uh, yeah. Oh, it, and we've got a question that may uh, relate to that. So, so what kind of improvements in device performance can uh, an OptiSpice user expect to gain compared to using other optimization tools. So, so I think they're getting at, is it a speed enhancement? Is it an accuracy? Is it uh, just, a, just a quicker optimization, uh, Jeff? So, well, overall, uh, we have a few advan we offer a few advantages. One, one is obviously um, fast and accurate simulation of optical devices. Um, and um, the accuracy gets I mean, as, as good as um, the modeling capabilities. Um, and um, one of the things OptiSpice does very well is um, handling um, non-linearities non um, during the transient simulation with the feedback involved as well. Um, so you can have feedback and non-linearities and OptiSpice um, does simulate that accurately. Um, so of, overall, um, the other advantage uh, we have is um, the full integration between optical and electrical devices in terms of being able to analyze the circuit performance. So you don't have to do the analysis separately, the optical and the electrical. You know, you, you would run you know, an optical simulation and then an electrical simulation and somehow find a way to combine them. Uh, for OptiSpice, it can be done all at the same time. Uh, again, you know, I keep talking about the feedback. So when you have a control circuit, um, and it can be based on um, neural nets. It could be a, or a simple PID or some more sophisticated circuit, um, but it can be all, all simulated with OptiSpice either in time domain or frequency domain. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Jim, we have another question. Uh, I think this is, this is from a person who uh, uh, asked a question earlier, so it's, it uh, may sound a bit like a follow-up, but uh, apparently uh, the gentleman who's asking uh, says that they have Opti, uh, I believe it's OptiSpice uh, 15 uh, version currently, and is it applicable um, uh, uh, with plugin for neural utility, I guess? I'm sorry, it's a, yeah, that's, uh, a um, little bit of mishmash of uh, yeah. abbreviations here. I was having trouble making no. it out. <laughs> that's all right. So um, I believe the person is mentioning actually OptiSystem because OptiSpice goes up to version six. OptiSystem goes up to version uh, 17 or 18 right now. Ah, okay. um, and we have co-simulation capabilities between OptiSpice and OptiSystem. The co right, right now, the co-simulation capability is mainly for the standalone version, though we have plans to extend that for um, any external Spice simulation engine. Um, because usually Spice simulation engines follow a um, certain set of rules or ideas when um, the simulation is, is done. Um, you start with a net list, which describes the series of connections and circuit parameters and simulation settings. Um, and then these settings are sent to an executable, which then runs the simulation. So this kind of workflow is very easy um, to, to integrate into Opti system. And we have done that once with our standalone version. Um, but we're planning on integrating the plugin version with Opti system as well. And what this, this is gonna allow is actually being able to use an external engine, a third party engine um, and plug that in with OptiSystem. Let's say you did um, a photonic chip design using uh, Siemens uh, LEDIT, and then you extracted the circuit and now you wanna build a larger a, a, a system with it. And this, this chip is part of the system. Um, we will be able to use that design and combine OptiSystem with an external simulation engine through the, through the OptiSpice plugin um, and do the full simulation. So this is um, a work that we, ha we have planned. Um, hopefully that answers the, the question. Uh, oh, oh, I think so very, very well, Jim, thank you. 
Uh, Jim, there is a, um, another question that came in, and I don't know if this was uh, someone uh, who's uh, offering to join <laughs> as part of a uh, uh, ongoing process, but uh, uh, he asks, uh, are you working with researchers or customers in the integration of OptiSpice? Uh, so this may refer to other uh, uh, EDA programs, or uh, I guess they're trying to get at uh, how, how it how the development process works. Mm -hmm. um, so you, we usually, um, currently we, we have one uh, plugin, uh, well, we have a plugin for one um, vendor that we're selling, which is Siemens EDA, though we're in the process, I cannot discuss all the details yet, but we're in the process of working with other vendors as well, other large EDA vendors. And usually the, um, the request comes from customers. So based on what the customer wants, then we, we go and work with the fabs. Uh, oh, sorry, we go work with the um, EDA vendors. Um, and obviously we, we go work with the fabs as well as, as necessary. Okay, excellent, excellent. Uh, another question, uh, do you need to do a DRC for your layout? Um, well, DRC is not, a, is not um, directly a used for OptiSpice simulations, though um, the workflow goes this way, you'd usually end up when you're designing a photonic integrated circuit, you end up with a mass layout that if you want to fabricate, you need to do, you need to do DRC on and make sure that the um, layout is DRC free. Uh, once you do that, then you can extract your circuit and run your simulation. So it is not um, a requirement of OptiSpice to have your circuit DRC. Um, though, if you're, it's a natural working process for 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 pick design. Okay, excellent, excellent. Uh, this uh, uh, this next question, Jim. I think uh, you may have already gone over this before, but uh, just uh, this might enable people who may have joined the call late to get uh, uh, sort of caught up. Uh, uh, does uh, 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 your software contain both electrical and optical? optical simulation or the optical simulation comes as third-party software. So I guess they're, they're, they're looking at kind of a, where does your product start and stop and then where does it go with other uh, uh, programs or work with other programs like, like mm -hmm. you mentioned the uh, Siemens uh, EDA tool. Yeah. So the standalone version of OptiSpice comes with both electrical and optical devices. Um, and when I'm talking about electrical, it's, you know, full uh, set of electrical devices, including nonlinear devices like, you know, MOSFETs and BJTs and trans all, all sorts of transistors um, and standard passive electrical devices and resistors, capacitors, and then, you know, voltage sources. Um, so for that, all, for the electrical side is covered in the, um, in the standalone version. And the standalone version also does have optical devices, obviously. Um, again, you know, lasers, photodiodes, and uh, passive devices, couplers, joiners, um, modulators, um, and many others. The plugin version, um, because it is intended to be used with another host engine, it either has optical devices or optoelectronic devices. And um, internally, we use some electrical devices for testing the, uh, the, the plugin version as well. But um, what we offer mainly is the optical device modeling add-on uh, for an external simulation engine that normally doesn't support um, this feature. And um, the simulation uh, models are the same. I mean, is um, if you're doing the electric and a standard uh, spice tool would do uh, a frequency domain simulation. And as soon as you add optical devices um, that is supported out of the box, same as the transient. Uh, when you're doing a transient simulation and you add optical devices for um, the spice engine uh, with the plugin, uh, you can do the optical simulations for uh, photonic devices and combined. Um, you don't have to separate them. Um, you, they they actually come out in the same net list. Okay, excellent, excellent, um, uh, Jim. This uh, I think pertains to near the close of uh, uh, your initial presentation. Uh, you were talking about one example where you had used OptiSpice, uh, uh, and you mentioned a projected yield in one simulation around 90%. And uh, 
and that you thought that uh, this could go even higher. So um, uh, would the yield typically improve the more times the simulation was run, effectively sort of fine tuning the design? Or does yield typically improve either at the fabrication stage or uh, further along as a, a company were to move towards a low rate initial production? Mm -hmm. So, well, the OptiSpice tool um, can be used to redesign the circuit to improve the yield. Um, what it does is it helps you look at the yield as the circuit is designed at, the, at a particular moment. Um, the yield usually depends on, on, on two factors. One is the accuracy um, or the, the fabrication process and the, the tolerances within that fabrication process. The second is how sensitive uh, your photonic integrated circuit design is to um, those processes or those um, uh, uh, fabrication process. So um, in that regard, um, what OptiSpice does is it helps users find weak points on their design and eliminate them. Um, and specifically when it's related to the, the fab fabrication tolerances. And that's one of the strengths of using the neural net model because it, it allows you to freely change and run Monte Carlo, change uh, physical parameters and run Monte, Monte Carlo simulations and run many, 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 many uh, what if scenarios um, on your circuit design. Though, I mean, I, I, in, 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 this, in the example, I only chose a few parameters, but you can do that with thousands of thousands, well, hundreds of parameters. Um, your simulation would take a bit longer to um, converge, um, but you, you, you can um, look at the yield um, of your chip this way. Okay, wow, wow. that is a fantastic flex flexibility. I know when I was working in the manufacturing side, just being able to account for variabilities like in materials. Uh, you know, I think material suppliers now at the fab, fab level are, are getting more and more and more uh, highly capable to be able to tell you, uh, okay, here's the, all the details, if you will, the fingerprints of the materials, but these things all can uh, impact circuit performance, uh, uh, you know, after, the after fabrication. So being able to model that going in with high accuracy is, a, is an amazing capability. Uh, uh, another question, uh, OptiSpice requires well-built compact models for accurate circuit simulation. How does OptiWave help users build compact models? Um, so um, I, I touched on this a little bit earlier, but the difficulty with, um, I'll, I'll go in a little bit uh, deeper. So um, when you compare the, um, the building of uh, compact models for electronics, um, its challenges have been mostly mostly resolved. Um, I'm not saying that they're trivial, but for many, many years, um, people have gathered a lot of experience in building very, very accurate um, compact models for, for electronics. Now, um, we are in earlier stages of building electric, optical compact models and optical compact mo model building come with its own challenges. Um, specifically, um, the physical dimensions of the device are very sensitive um, in terms of device operation. So slight differences in the physical characteristics of the device can make uh, a big impact on the device performance or the circuit performance. Um, now, how, how do we account for that or how do we figure out how, to, how do we build a compact model that can take these into account? Well, you have two approaches. You can either build many, many, many uh, variations of a single device um, and then measure them all well, that is obviously costly and uh, time consuming. The alternative is to run um, simulation tools um, and that can also be costly uh, depending on, as long as you find the right tool, they're usually okay. But um, depending on the modeling uh, you need to do, you might end up running 3D FTTD simulations which uh, may take a long time to simulate. Um, so what we're trying to do with um, the neural net is to help you uh, to make sure the users don't have to worry about going through all these processes. Uh, we work with the fabs um, either based on their simulation results or using, um, sorry, uh, experimental results or uh, generating simulation results uh, to build the compact models as flexible as possible. We have many simulation tools that help with that. Uh, we have FDTD and BPM. Uh, to be able to do passive devices, for example. 
and build compact models so that users get the flexibility out of the box um, as soon as they purchase Spice with, um, uh, along with a PDK, those models are ready for them so they can either uh, account for uh, sensitivities on the fabrication and check their uh, chip yields um, or fine tune their design um, and play with the, um, extend um, the uh, basic, the capabilities of basic devices uh, provided by the fabs. Excellent, excellent. Uh, uh, Jen, this next question, uh, I think kind of plays into that and this gets a little bit more tech specific uh, in terms of what kind of technology. So in other words, uh, uh, 2, 6, 3, 5, et cetera, uh, does the OptiSpice plugin support? Um, right now, um, well, our, our modeling tool is actually a platform agnostic. Um, as long as the modeling is done, uh, we can support either silicon or 3.5 and OptiSpice is, is specifically very good uh, for silicon photonics because of its ability to support electronic simulations along optics at the same time. Excellent, excellent. And um, uh, uh, another question, uh, what are the unique capabilities of OptiSpice and why the neural networks are a good fit for the models? Um, so a few, few, few of them. I mean, we took advantage of um, the integration with, uh, with electrical modeling capabilities very well with both the standalone and the, and the plug-in version of OptiSpice. Um, as I mentioned uh, many times, um, the uh, electro-optic, well, first of all, being able to, to um, do a full optoelectronic circuit design without going through two different um, uh, um, simulation uh, engines is, is one, of the, one of the main advantages. And not only that, but the users can bring, on, bring in their own um, uh, electronic uh, integrated circuit designs. Uh, if they already usually when we're, you're working with the big um, EDA vendors, a lot of the companies already have um, many different uh, for integrated circuit designs um, that they're combining with photonics. Um, so now you don't have to worry about while well, using different uh, types of engines to, to be able to make sure that your design is working correctly. Um, why the neural network is a, is a good fit. Um, it is because, I mean, um, we, it, it allows many different possibilities uh, for OptiSpice and OptiSpice does not restrict the user in terms of what kind of circuit you can build with it. Um, again, this comes, com comes back down to uh, being able to simulate both optics and electronics uh, and have good convergence. So if, you're, uh, if you have a great variations in, in nonlinearities in your, in your circuit, and you, you're likely going to get that with the neural net model. Um, OptiSpice is, is very good at, at handling that. Excellent, excellent. Uh, are there uh, uh, differences in simulation speed and numerical accuracy between uh, two versions of OptiSpice? Um, well, the, um, the numerical accuracy actually depends a lot on the simulation engine itself. Um, but because the methods that are used uh, for these simulation engines are quite standardized, um, the speed and the, ac well, the, the accuracy um, differences between the standalone version and, and the plug-in plug, uh, plug version is negligible actually. Um, and, and then the speed, um, I would say again, um, the differences between the standalone and the plug-in um, is not that big as well because the uh, what makes a big difference uh, for the simulation speed is first the number of devices and um, for optics, uh, how many channels and modes um, you have in your circuit. Um, and again, um, they will work uh, same way between the standalone and the plug-in version. So um, the users can expect um, them to work the same way um, to, no matter which version they're using. Okay. So there is no loss in accuracy or speed using one over the other. Excellent, Jim. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Jim, another question just came in. Uh, we're getting close to our time. So uh, I, I think we have time for this one, though. Uh, is it possible to export AC 
simulation results to Excel. Yes, so um, th there are many ways to do so. I'm, I'm not quite sure if this relates to the plugin or the standalone version. Um, for the standalone version, uh, and both standalone and the plugin actually, there are ways to export data in, uh, in a CSV format then you can import into, into Excel or any other tool. Um, the standalone version uh, supports also um, a HDF5 uh, format. So it will export the simulation results in HDF5 format, uh, which will allow you to, to be able to um, load the data either in, 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 in your favorite um, a numerical modeling environment, like, you know, if you, or programming environment or scripting environment, it could be C++. Uh, Python, MATLAB, um, or any um, any uh, programming language that supports HDF5 um, can import the results, and then users can do their post processing how how they want. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you, thank you, Jim. I certainly appreciate that, Jim. That looks like our last uh, question for now. Uh, so let me um, uh, just uh, share a few uh, wrap up uh, comments with the audience. Uh, for those uh, of you that uh, may have joined late, uh, this uh, program will be available for replay. These are usually posted within 24 hours, and anyone who is pre-registered for the event uh, will get a notification that the replay is available. Also, uh, I believe we've covered all questions live here, uh, but uh, certainly if anyone who uh, had a question, we answered it but you had a follow-up question or perhaps you wanted more specific details, uh, Jim's contact information is uh, in the presentation. It'll be on our website as well once the webinar is posted there again. So you'll be able to reach out, contact him directly. Uh, if any questions come in late, uh, those are relayed uh, to the company, uh, OptiWave. And uh, 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 Jim is very good about getting back to people as quickly as possible, usually within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, I'd like to, uh, uh, on behalf of Angel Business Communications and PIC Magazine, I'd like to thank uh, uh, OptiWave for sponsoring today's webinar and, and Jim for his gold mine of information that he provided. Uh, thank you very much everyone for attending and thank you again to OptiWave for a great webinar.